we are going to address and talk about the mo perhaps the most enigmatic, most misunderstood, mo probably the, the most pivotal and central figure and I don't, I hope I'm not overstating this, but I don't think I am, in the entire continuum of Jewish history, probably the most central figure to Judaism as a whole. It's a big statement. Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, not exactly chopped liver. But David HaMelech, King David, and I hope that you will agree with, agree with me after we finish this class. His soul, his neshama, his significance permeates the entire Torah and has an impact on our lives today, perhaps more than any other biblical figure. So where do we start? Bereshis Bara, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created Adam Harishon, Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve were created, we are told, on Friday, the sixth day of creation. And they're created in the seventh hour of the day, or the, excuse me, the ninth hour of the day, according to the Medrash. And they were created and placed in Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, and they were given one mitzvah. And we all know what that is. The mitzvah of not eating from the tree of knowledge, from the Eitz Hada'at. And our sages tell us that had Adam and Eve been able to contain themselves for three hours until Shabbat, God would have served them from this tree of knowledge. The intent was not to deny them the benefits of this tree. The intent was to give them knowledge and insight that would help them serve God, that would be given to them by Hashem on God's terms. They stuck their hands into the cookie jar three hours, too early. And so by extending themselves and eating from the tree of knowledge, they brought the world into a state of disrepair and to a circumstance where we are still working to try to rectify those three hours or that misdeed. And it's interesting. If you remember that Torah portion, there is an expression that is not used very often. Chava sees, and the Torah says, that she sees this tree of knowledge, it is pleasant in appearance to her eyes. I want you to remember this statement. It's pleasant to her eyes. What do we mean by that exactly? When Adam fell from his high state of connection to Hashem, he scanned the entire history and looked through 
all the reservoir of souls. And he found the soul, according to the Medrash of King David, David HaMelech. And he saw that this soul was only going to live for three hours. The amount of time that Adam and Eve were lacking in terms of their completion. They were created on the ninth hour. They had three hours to go. They kind of lost those three hours. King David was going to bring the world back to its intended state, but he was only given three hours to live. So what did he do, the Medrash tells us? He gifted 70 years of his life to David. Adam was supposed to live for a thousand years. He died at 930. And David HaMelech lived exactly 70 years. So right away, from the get-go, King David is a very important part of the cosmos, of the universe, of life. The neshama, the soul of David HaMelech, now has to make its way from on high to become engaged in the physical world. And I will take you on a journey, and together we will trace the seed of King David. And we will be astonished to learn that it is not smooth sailing, that it is not a process that you would imagine would be the process of such a holy and righteous soul as David HaMelech's. And so fast forward a couple of generations. Abraham, he becomes the first Jew, he discovers God, he teaches the world monotheism, and he is a childless. He adopts a nephew, Lot. In Lech Lecha, the Torah tells us about how Lot was his, literally his son. He was, uh, went down to Egypt with him. He came back from Egypt with a lot of cattle, a lot of produce. And then there was a little, a little squabble between the shepherd of Abraham and the shepherd of Lot. And Lot, excuse me, went to south to Sodom. And then uh, Sodom is destroyed, and Lot and his, two, his, his wife had turned around to look, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. And Lot, with his two daughters, run Hahara to the mountains. And um, the Torah tells us what happens with Lot and his two daughters in the cave. They think that the whole world is destroyed, and there's nobody going to uh, perpetuate the species to continue the line. And they have incestuous relationships with their father, and they give birth to two children. One of them was Moab. Moab literally means Mayav from my father. And this Moab becomes a nemesis of the Jewish people. And later, provides us with Ruth, who is a Moabite woman. Ruth is the, the great-grandmother of David HaMelech, of King David. But I'm going to get back to it, and I'll kind of take you through it and, and, and get into a little bit more detail of how Ruth emerges from Moab. And as wicked and as evil as Moab was, as cruel as Moab was, Ruth emerges as this paradigm of kindness and goodness. Not a very illustrious pedigree, to say the least. Well, that's um, David's maternal line. Let's take a look at his paternal line. So, a couple of uh, generations forward. Uh, Yehuda, Jacob has 12 children. Joseph is the favored one. Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. Yehuda separates himself from his brothers. 
and he goes away from them and he marries this, uh, this woman. He has a couple of children. He finds a wife for his oldest son. Her name was, anyone want to venture? What was her name? That wife he had, Tamar. Excellent. Tamar. Tamar marries the older one, Shela, and uh, he passes away. And then his second son, uh, which he gives, Tamar marries the, the second brother in the Leveret tradition. And uh, the second son passes away. And uh, then the third son, he's a little hesitant. <laughs> he's not exactly sure. Why are these kids dying? And he says to her, he says, go back to your father's house. I'll call you when I'm ready. You know what that means. Don't call me, I'll call you. And in Takia, he has no intention of giving her to his, his youngest son, whose name is Shayla, actually. So Yehuda's wife passes away. And Tamar realizes that Yehuda has no intention of giving of allowing her to marry his thir her third son. She desperately knew and she saw that she was to have children with Yehuda's family. So she disguises herself as a harlot and she, she places herself at the crossroads. And Yehuda, it is said in the Gemara that Yehuda had no interest, but this malach put into him this incredible desire that he couldn't overcome. And he has relations with Tamar, and Tamar becomes pregnant with twins. And then they, they see that she's pregnant, which means that she somehow violated the trust. And in those days, that was punishable by death. She was going to be taken out to be uh, stoned or burned. And she holds up the signet ring that Yehuda had gave her as a collateral for the money he was going to send. And I'm not going into all the details of the story. He sent the money, he couldn't find her. And then Yehuda confesses and stands up and saves her life and says, no, she did the right thing. She, it was, I am the fraud. And because I didn't give her to my youngest son, uh, he, he accepted what happened. She was allowed to live. She gives birth to twins, Peretz and Zorach. Peretz becomes the ancestor of Boaz. Boaz is that elderly fella who lives in the time of Ruth, who marries Ruth and gives birth to David's great-grandfather. And that's just fascinating that something so holy is channeled through less than perhaps holy circumstances. You would think that the way David HaMelech's ancestry would develop would be, you know, the Mechutanim would be the most honored and respected of the community, Rabbanim, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Nagidim, and, and people who are acknowledged leaders of the, of the, of the time, Constantly throughout the ages, you'd be able to trace your lineage. Everybody is so proud when they find that there was a rabbi in their line and a holy rabbi, a famous rabbi. And David HaMelech looks back. <laughs> and who are his grandparents? Lot. And Yehuda, of course, is an illustrious grandparent. But why? Why is it that this neshama, is, is filtered in through, uh, in a sense, uh, less than stellar circumstances. And so, just to throw out a couple of thoughts, and I'm sure you might have some on your own, is that um, the whole definition of holiness and good is when you contrast it against darkness and evil and struggle. And what life is about, it's about extracting the kernels of light, of goodness, from the chaff, from the rest of everything that's around it. Then you really appreciate 
the power of holiness and good. But when it's always surrounded with holiness and light, that kernel of goodness is never really tested. It's never really worked. It never really has, has to kick in the afterburners. And so it is deliberate that a person like King David, whose life mirrors, in a sense, the process that brought him to life, a life of struggle, a life of challenge, a life of triumph over those challenges, should be brought into this world through a process that people could turn their nose up at, through a pedigree that is less than perfect. Because the superficial external aspects of what we would consider today perfect are, are really just superficial window dressings. It's what you do with your life that really counts, not where you come from. And this message is loud and clear. David HaMelech became David HaMelech not because life was easy for him, but because, as we're going to see, more difficult than you ever imagined. And that's really the key to greatness. And so it's really important that we talk about this Moab connection, this Lot, Moab, and then as we move forward in history, take a look at what the Torah has to say about Moab. Moab, the Torah says, that people from the tribe of Moab can never, ever be allowed into the people of Israel. No converts from the tribe of Moab. What does the Torah say about the Egyptians? The Egyptians persecuted us for 210 years. They killed our babies. They devastated and destroyed us. And yet, after three generations, an Egyptian is allowed into the people of Israel. Esau, Edo, hates us with a passion. But Esau is our brother. So he's not completely, people from the, people, people from the uh, tribe of Edom are not universally, eternally banned from the Jewish people. But Moab is. The Torah says, Gam doer ha'asiri la'yovay lahem b'kahal Hashem. Even the 10th generation, and it doesn't mean after 10 they are allowed. It just means even 10 and beyond 10. And Ruth emerges from Moab. And we all know the story of Ruth. But just to recap, Elimelech was a, a great personage at that time. And he abandoned the Jewish people with his two sons and with Naomi. They went to the fields of Moab. Machlon and Kilion, the two sons of Elimelech, marry Ruth and Orpah. Moabite princesses, and there's a whole discussion whether they converted, whether they didn't convert. Machlin and Kilion die without children. Elimelech dies before. Tamar, um, Naomi is bereft and devastated and alone, and it's time for her to go back to the land of Israel. There's nothing for her here. And she says to her two daughters-in-law, you know, leave me alone, I'm an old woman. Go back to your families, you'll find other husbands, you'll make a life for yourself. And no, the two, they start escorting her on the way and she turns around to them again and she says, you know, this is not gonna work. Um, you're an embarrassment to me. You're not gonna find any husbands in Israel. No one's gonna marry you. Go, go, I won't hold it against you. And Arpa turns around and leaves. In fact, it's interesting that the name Arpa means shoulder. She kind of gives Naomi her back and she leaves. Ruth Dovkaba. Ruth clings to Naomi. And as many times as Naomi encourages her to leave, she's even more determined 
to stick with Naomi. And in fact, some of the aspects of conversion are taken from the story and how she tries to dissuade her once, twice, and three times. And finally, she sees that she's sincere and she stops trying to dissuade her. And Ruth cleaves to Naomi and they come back to Bethlehem in Israel and there's the whole story about how she goes to collect some, uh, some produce for her mother-in-law in the fields of Boaz, who's a relative of Elimelech. Naomi finds out that Boaz uh, was, took, took an interest in her, uh, not because she was a young maiden, but because he saw she was a poor girl. And he asks who she is, and yes, Boaz said, I've heard of your kindness. Now remember, Moab is known for their cruelty. And here Ruth is kisheshana ben achoichim. She's like a rose among thorns. She takes whatever vestige of kindness that is left in Moab and she takes it with her. And Ruth sticks with Naomi and Boaz, says, this is your field, don't go anywhere else. I will protect you and I will, I will take care of you. Ruth comes home, she tells Naomi what's going on. Naomi's ecstatic. She says, you just keep going down to that field. And the time of the harvest is over. Boaz makes no attempt to uh, engage her in any way, in any relationship. And Naomi is devastated. She hopes that Boaz maybe would take an interest on a romantic level. And she plans with Ruth what they're going to do. It's an interesting story and everything has to be understood on the highest level of purity as both of them were intending. At any rate, she meets Boaz at the threshing, at the threshing floor and she says to Boaz that it is your responsibility to redeem your relative by marrying me. And she says it, of course, in a veiled reference, throw your cloak over me, whatever the euphemisms were. were. And Boaz says, you're right. However, there is a relative that's closer than I. And that relative needs to be given the right of first refusal. So don't worry, tomorrow we're going to have a Bethden. We're going to call the other relative to the Bethden. We're going to give him his first, that right of first refusal. And if he doesn't marry you, then I will. Boaz is, by the way, 80 years old at the time. And he's actually, something he says that's very significant, he says, that this kindness and selflessness is greater than the one that you did with Naomi because I'm an old man and you're a young, beautiful woman. What are you looking, why are you chasing me, so to speak? So we understood that her intentions were totally pure. So the next day, this guy named Plony Almoni, it's like Mr. John Doe. The Torah doesn't name him. Plony Almoni. Somebody, Mr. So-and-so. A lot of explanation as to why, but he didn't deserve to be named, perhaps. He comes by, and Boaz, there's, there's 10 people or rabbis um, sitting there, and he says, uh, Ruth, excuse me, Naomi, our relative, came back from the fields of Moab. She has some fields that, she needs to, that we need to redeem. Are you prepared and ready to redeem them? And he says... Um, Absolutely, it's my duty to do so. He says, well, together with the fields, Ruth is part of the package. And, and, and Plony Almoni says, whoa, 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 wait a second. You mean the, the, Moabite, the Moabite woman? You want me to marry the Moabite woman? What are you out of your mind? Don't you know the Torah forbids us to marry a Moabite woman? We all know that the Moabites are not allowed into the people of Israel. That Machlin and Killian married Moabites doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. So no, I, I, uh, I can't do that. This is the key. Boaz, being a leader of the Jewish people, 
knew that when the Torah prohibited the Moabite community of entering into the land of Israel, it was not including the women, only the men. Moab lo Moabi. It was only a male thing. And this oral tradition fell into disuse because there were not a lot of Moabites who even wanted to convert to Judaism in those days. In fact, in fact hundreds of years can go by without one single Moabite woman or man attempting to convert. So this law or rule fell into disuse. And it was forgotten and it was just generally accepted by the pop populace and by the, even by the, even by the, uh, the rabbis that it was an all-inclusive prohibition. But Boaz knew differently. Boaz knew that this was key. And now was the time to bring, to revive this halacha. And there was a reason for this distinction. It wasn't just halacha l'mesha misinai without any reason. And it is different and unusual because when it comes to a mamzer, an illegitimate child, there is no difference between men and women. When it comes to the Egyptian prohibition, there is no difference between men and women. When it comes to the Edomite prohibition, there is no difference between men and women. So why in the world, the other rabbis were asking Boaz, should there be a difference when it comes to Moab? Well, Boaz says, very simple. Because when you take a look in the Torah as to why the Moabites are not allowed to enter into the Jewish people, the Torah gives us a reason. Where it doesn't give us a reason in some of the others. It says, Al devar asher kidmu eschem balechem uvamayim. Because they didn't come out to feed you when you were starving and thirsty, when you were passing along the way, when they, you were not threatening them. And that cruelty is an anathema to the Jewish people. And women were not expected to go out from their tents to the road to feed the wayfarers. It was the man's responsibility to do that. And therefore, the women were never, never included in that prohibition. So Ruth becomes okay. But not everybody agreed with it. You know, try bringing something new to your synagogue. <laughs> that nobody ever uh, heard of before. And you say, yeah, yeah, it's in the bylaws from 50 years ago. It's going to take a little while till people get on board, right? Even if you're right. Boaz married Ruth. And it says all the rabbis rejoiced in this wedding and they gave her so many blessings. You're going to be like Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. That night, Ovid, David's, great -grand David's grandfather, is uh, conceived. And the next morning, they're attending Boaz's funeral. Boaz dies that night. And so you can imagine what people were saying. Boaz was wrong. That, it, that a Moabite woman is not allowed into the community. Look what happened to her. But really, this was God's way of making things a little interesting. <laughs> not making it simple. Boaz passed away because he was only kept alive for that very purpose of continuing the line of Yehuda to facilitate the birth of David HaMelech. Once that purpose was achieved, he was taken back to his place in Gan Eden. But the, wa the tongues wagged. And in Ruth, there's no longer any mention about the rabbis congratulating Ruth on the birth of Oved because they were out of there. They didn't want to have anything to do with this Ruth. And in fact, even Naomi, it says, it says the Naomi's friends, 
Who gives Oved his name? Not his mother, not his Bobby. Nobody. It's the friends that give the name to the baby. And so from the very beginning, this family is under a cloud of illegitimacy that is going to dog David to the end of his life, almost. Definitely through a very big part of his life, as we'll see soon. So Oved grows, and um, he is such a righteous person that people begin to accept him, and they say, well, maybe we're wrong. Maybe, the, maybe a Moabite woman is allowed. Because if a Moabite woman would not be allowed, then something so beautiful wouldn't be able to come out of this. And then Yishai was the, the, the uh, role model for the entire generation. And Yishai's children, seven children, all of them great and handsome and powerful and righteous and, and scholarly. Slowly but surely, the people began to accept the family and not question, not question their lineage. Here we come to a part of the, of the narrative that I myself find it very hard to repeat because it's, 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 it's way out there. But it's in the Medrash and it gives us some, some, a deeper appreciation for what, what David has to go through. Jesse, getting older, you know what happens when you get a little older? Start getting a little bit more righteous. You're uh, thinking about, you know, your Yoim Hadin. And Jesse begins to doubt his own lineage. Maybe I am illegitimate, he says to himself. And if I am illegitimate, then I'm not allowed to live with my wife who is a legitimate, full-fledged Jewess. And it, for some reason, it gives him no rest, and he's torn. And we are told in the Medrash that he divorces his wife as a result. I'm not allowed to live with you. Maybe I'm not allowed to live with you. As heartbreaking as that is. But a while later, he realizes also that it's not proper to be without a wife. But what is he going to do? He can't marry a non-Jewish woman because maybe he's Jewish. He can't marry a Jewish woman because maybe he's illegitimate. Lost it, man. Well, this is what he did. He had a maidservant, and he gave her a conditional emancipation, a conditional release. An illegitimate person is allowed to marry a maidservant, but a Jewish person is not allowed to marry a maidservant unless she's free. So he freed her conditionally. He said, if I am legitimate, then you're freed. And if I'm not legitimate, then you're not freed. We won't go into the um, viability of this, but this is what he did. Meanwhile, the maidservant was very loyal to her mistress. And she came to her and she said, I know how much you want to be reunited with your husband. Let's do a Rachel Leia deal. And so she switched places with her, with her mistress. And in those days, it was very possible not to know who you were with until much later, just like that with Rachel and Leah. So he was with his own wife, and that's when King David was conceived. It's a crazy story, a fantastic story. But if I didn't have ironclad sources for the story, I wouldn't even articulate it here. But it gives us some idea of what's going on. So he didn't know that it was his own wife. She becomes pregnant, and he begins to wonder, like, how is she pregnant? Did she go and marry somebody else without, you know... And uh, he separated but didn't divorce her. And the sons were all angry at this. And he, Yishai, quieted it down and said, listen, let's just, you know, hush this thing up. 
let the baby be born, and the baby was born into an environment of hostility, of illegitimate, an illegitimate kind of aura. This is an illegitimate son. We are going to separate him from the rest of the family. We're not going to allow him to be identified with our family because he's illegitimate and we don't want to uh, you know, allow him into the rest of the community, so to speak. So David HaMelech, from the cradle, is a stranger to his own family. David HaMelech is born into hostility. And we find psalms that reflect that angst that David HaMelech expresses. He says, Muzar hayisi le'achai. I was a stranger to my own brothers. Ki avi ve'imi azovani, he says in uh, Le David Hashem Ori, which we're going to begin to say every, every day in the month of Elul. My parents have turned from me. Have, have abandoned me. However, his mother would constantly tell him, David, you're kosher. You're good. You're legitimate. It's not the time to tell anybody right now. But just take it. Your time will come. So David Amelech is raised as a pariah in his own family. That's why they send him out to the sheep to separate him from the rest of them. He hardly ever is at home. And when he comes home, it's very tense. So he doesn't even bother coming home. And it is in those years that Hashem provided for him the ability and the opportunity to mold his relationship with God. Many of the Psalms were composed during those years of his shepherding, of his isolation from society and from his family. And it was, in retrospect, one of the foundations of who he became later. He wasn't distracted by the distractions that you would have if you would be part of society. He was able to maintain his dignity and not to allow himself to be defined by others and by how others saw him, but to be defined by who he knew he was and his relationship and connection to Hashem. And that's when he developed this incredible ability to communicate with God on that very beautiful, special way. So now, let's leave David and his family. Let's go to what is going on in the larger Jewish picture at the time. Saul, King Saul, was the first king. He was a, a righteous person. He was a powerful person. He was a very dignified person. But he was not destined to continue as king and his children were not destined to continue as king because he violated God's command when it came to the Amalekites and he found it difficult to acknowledge his sin. And Samuel, who was the prophet of the day, of the era, told him that that God has, has turned from you, from you being a king, you continuing, your line continuing. Saul was very distressed by this, but he was going to be allowed to finish his tenure, his, uh, his own reign, but his children would not continue. So God comes to Samuel and says, I want you to go to the family of Jesse and anoint for me the next king in Israel. But it has to be very, very quiet. Because Saul is not, not to find out that another king is going to be anointed in his lifetime. 
So Samuel knew Jesse. Jesse was one of the most prominent families in Israel. So Samuel comes to Bethlehem, and he lets Jesse know that he would like to have dinner with them. He has something very special and important to speak to them about. And he asks him to gather his entire family. And God says that from the sons of Jesse, I am going to anoint the next king. Samuel comes to the home. The, the, the sons are lined up. And Eliav, the first son, stands before Samuel. Tall, handsome, charismatic, righteous. Yeah, yeah, this is it. This is the king. And Samuel says to himself, yeah, this is the right one. God gives him such a rebuke, such a chastisement. Because many years before, Samuel had told a group of people that if you need to have anything, if you need any help, come to me, I'll help you. And he didn't imply that everything that he has is from Hashem. So now Hashem forces him to acknowledge that. And he says um, to Samuel, famous, he says, don't judge a book by its cover. That's what he says. He says, Ha'adam nayim. A person sees what his eyes see. Hashem yirelalevav. But God sees into the heart. Eliav is not fit to be a king. One by one, the sons come before him. One by one, Samuel thinks maybe this is it, and no, God says no. And then all of the sons pass by, and he doesn't find the, 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 the king, the future king, and now Samuel's all flustered, all puzzled. What's going on? Here I am, all the sons are, have come before me, and I haven't found the right person. So Samuel says to Jesse, can it be? that you have some other youths that have not been brought in before me? Now, recognize that he didn't say, do you have any other sons? Because if he would have said, do you have any other sons, Jesse would have said no. And think about it for a moment. Even if David was the black sheep of the family, and even if he wasn't someone to be proud of, would Yishai not include him when God's command was to bring all your children to the table? How could he have left David out? And how could he have remained silent when his other children didn't, didn't meet the criteria? And then say, perhaps, maybe we should bring David. Because Jesse genuinely did not consider David his son. So, but when Samuel said, do you have any other youths? He couldn't ignore that. He said, yes, there's a small one, 28 years old, with the sheep. Well, Samuel says, bring him. David walks in, and the Tanakh, in a very rare description of physical features, says that David was Adomi, Samuel, Samuel, looks at King David, short, diminutive in stature, handsome, yes, ruddy complexion, and he says, this? And God says, this is the next king of Israel. Anoint him. And he anoints David, and Jesse starts crying. And Jesse realizes that it is his son. And everything becomes clear in that one instant of what happened all these years. The brothers recognize it, and David is instantly legitimized in the eyes of his family. Others in the community still didn't think very much of David. Now let's take a look for a moment at how the Torah describes David HaMelech. 
Admoni. Who else is described in the Torah as, Ad, as Admoni? Come on, guys. Esau. Great. Esau. Esau. Described as an Admoni. Another description. Yefehi le'enayim. Yafahi le'enayim. Nice, beautiful eyes. Where do we have that other expression? We mentioned it at the beginning of the class. Chava with the tree of knowledge. Also, very, very um, rare expression related to eyes. And so our sages tell us that Chava's attraction through her eyes led her astray. And David would rectify that. David would use his eyes for God. Except once. And we'll talk about that. He was an Admoni. Our sages tell us that David Amelech was a violent... He had a violent spiritual DNA, like Esau. Esau, we're told, and David Amalek had the same spiritual root. They came from the same, you might say, um, zodiac of, of uh, spiritual uh, natures. But Esau used his violent nature to rebel against God David curbed his violent nature to serve God. He fought the wars to protect and build the people of Israel. So he was violent in nature. It just gives us some insight into the struggle that David had to bring to the fore every day of his life. It wasn't a simple, easy deal for David Amela. And so... He was able to sublimate that nature. We're told that in the Gemara, that if somebody feels some type of inexplicable gravitation to blood, he should become a moil. <laughs> or a shaykhet. Channel it, my friends, channel it. Don't deny it. Don't repress it. Because then it will come out inappropriately somewhere else. But channel it. So David HaMelech channeled this. So King David, now he's anointed. And he goes back to his, uh, his sheep. Everything is going to move along as normal. No perceptible change in, uh, on any level. But the, the instant that David is anointed, Saul's melancholy begins. Because there are, you don't have, you can't have two kings at once. So maybe Saul was like the, you know, um, de facto king, but David was a de jure king. He was just in hiding still, but real sovereignty. And in, in the Torah, sovereignty is a reflection of God's special spirit. It's not a matter of election, so to speak. The one who God infuses with this special spirit of sovereignty is the king, regardless of who's in the palace. So Saul becomes a shell of a king. And that's why the Philistines begin to harass the Jewish people and all of a sudden Saul, the great warrior, doesn't know what to do. He's, he's overcome with fear and indecisiveness. And Goliath starts, Goliath starts harassing and um, insulting the Jewish people and the Jewish God. Every day, Goliath is coming to this mountaintop and they're saying, why should we destroy each other's lands? Let's just have a duel. You send your strongest person. If you win, we will be your servants. And if we win, you will be our servants. Why have all this collateral damage that you have to build, rebuild after the war? Practical. 
And meanwhile, Goliath is assaulting the Jewish people daily and mocking God and the armies of Israel every single day. And no one has the courage to, step, to come forward. David, meanwhile, David, was sent by his father to bring provisions to his brothers. He comes into the camp. He hears the Goliath blaspheming Hashem. He can't take it. His blood is boiling. The spirit of Hashem is, is pounding in him. But he's humble. He doesn't want it to be noticed, so to speak, that he is a person of valor. So what does he do? He goes around asking people, what is this reward that the king put out for anybody who stands against Goliath? And the king had said, the person who is victorious against Goliath will marry my daughter. I will give him my daughter. So David made it look like his only interest was Saul's daughter. That he's a bounty hunter, basically. And he comes to Saul and he says, please let me go. And Saul says, you're just a lad. How can I let you go? It's irresponsible. He says, don't worry. I know that I can do this. I ripped apart a bear and a, and a, and a, and a lion once. And, and uh, Saul decides to let him go. He tries on the armor. F famous Medrash. Saul was a big, tall man. David was a small, short guy. And the armor fit miraculously. David saw the armor fit. He said, I don't want this armor. Saul saw the armor fit. And he had a fit, and he understood something is not so good for him here. So David goes out to face Goliath, and we all know the story. There are those that say that David's confidence came from the fact that the spirit of Hashem was now with him, Others say, no, it had nothing to do with the spirit of Hashem. He had confidence in his physical strength that he would be able to overcome Goliath. Whatever the explanation is, he did it. And now the people are just enamored by him. And Saul, the Tanakh records, Saul turns to his people and says, who is that who just killed Goliath? Ah, <laughs> who is that? He's the, the, the one who played the harp for you for all these years to keep you from your melancholy. He's your beloved David. What do you mean, who is that? So I say just explain is that he wasn't asking who he, he knew who he was. He was asking, which line of Yehuda does he come from? If he comes from Zarach, he's not going to be the next king. If he comes from Peretz, then I'm a little concerned. And Doeg, a very unscrupulous character, gets up and says, why are you so concerned whether he comes from Perez or from Zarach? He's not even legitimate. And Doeg begins this whole thing about he's a Moabite. She is a, his grandmother was a Moabitess and she's not allowed to marry into the people of Israel and he's an illegitimate child, so don't even worry about him. And a whole big war ensues in the Sanhedrin Finally, it's established that a Moabite woman is allowed, but it's already being brought to the surface again. And we all know what happens, and I have to kind of go a little bit fast forward here. That David is pursued by Saul for many, many years. He refuses to kill Saul on a number of instances when he could. He always responded in kindness but he was pursued by Saul, who hated him. Hated him and knew that this was going to be the one who would not allow his son, Jonathan, who ironically was one of the dearest friends of King David in his youth. The Pirkei Avot holds up the relationship of Jonathan and David as the paradigm of altruistic friendship. And David was the one who was not going to allow him, Jonathan, to become the king. His father was consumed by hatred. Jonathan was consumed by love for God. But David was on the run for a great part of his life. And you would think, after having such a difficult upbringing, and now he's already anointed as the king, 
he would say to God, what do you want from me? Haven't I been through enough? You've anointed me as the king. And now I have to run for my life. Is this what a king looks like? And yet, David, whenever he had an opportunity, he would write a psalm expressing his soul's connection to God in the context of the difficulties that he was living through. So you open the book of Psalms and you find a prayer for every circumstance, for every human condition. When David is saved, he praises God for his salvation. When he's in the depths of despair, he reaches out to God for help. When his family is with him, he praises Hashem. When there's conflict in his family, he is in distress, he reaches out for Hashem. Love, fear, glorifying, idolizing, pleading, beseeching. You see a person who feels so close to God in one psalm and so far from God in another. But the message is, as far as you are, you're still connected. You're, st you're, still, you're still in the playing field. You're still in the theater of operation. You're still there. And that thread of connection, David shares with us. And that's why the Psalms have become such an incredible part of our lives as Jews throughout the ages. I don't know exactly the percentage, but it's 60 to 70% of all our prayers are taken from Psalms. It is the single most used resource of the rabbis in the times of the temple for the creation and the development of our tefillot, of our prayers. Because David HaMelech, more than anyone else, expresses the range of emotion, the range of human circumstance that all of us throughout the ages can relate to. Keeps us humble when we're doing well, and keeps us heartened when we're not doing so well. So if you look into the Psalms, you'll find a Psalm for every occasion, so to speak. And you'll find a human heart pouring itself out to Hashem. And if David HaMelech, King David, when everything was going against him, found it within himself to reach out to God, then that's an inspiration for us. We have images of royalty, that royalty is a life of comfort, a life of power, a life of unmitigated, unlimited ability to do whatever we want. And King David's life was the exact opposite of that. Yes, he had power. Yes, he had status. But he had tzoros. He had family tzoros. He should not have the family tzoros that David Amalek had. Two children rebelling against him, trying to drive him out. And David threw out his tzoros, threw out his suffering, was a shining example of bringing the best out of any circumstance that confronts us. So David HaMelech finally becomes the king. And he's having some good years. And then in one of the Psalms, we find an interesting request. David HaMelech says, Choneni Hashem v'naseni. David HaMelech, according to the Medrash, is having a conversation with God, and he says, why is it, God, that when we say in the Shemona Esrei, um, Baruch Atah Hashem Mogain Avraham, why Avraham? So Hashem says, because he was tested with 10 tests, and he passed them all. So David HaMelech said, well, test me. He was feeling that 
after everything he had been through, what could be, what, what test would be more uh, difficult than what he's been through? You know, to be, to be raised as an outcast and to have so much love in your heart? David said, I can handle it. So Hashem says, okay, I'll test you. And he failed. Some say, how much he failed? Did he sin? Did he not sin? Technically, not technically. But what did he fail? In what realm? In the realm of carnal desire. He, that night, that's David HaMelech said, he goes up on the roof, he sees Bathsheba, and he's taken by her beauty, and he has Uriah uh, killed, and the story that many are familiar with. He marries Bathsheba. Solomon is born from that union. Another child that is born later passes away, actually, from, from the initial meeting with Bathsheba. But he sins, or he loses, or he, he fails the test through the Enayim. It's the eyes that Yefehi Le'enayim, where David is so careful to keep focused on God that instant that he saw Bathsheba, for that instant, he lost his focus. And that's when he failed the test. Not later. What he did later was just, that was just the, the effect. But the real failure was that for a split second, he lost his, relation, his connection to God. And... Nathan the prophet comes to him. Remember that story? Nathan the prophet comes to the king and has the courage to say to the king, if you remember the famous interchange, he tells him a story about a poor farmer who had one calf and this rich farmer didn't want to use his own calves so he came to the poor farmer's calf and he stole the poor, poor, uh, poor farmer's calf for a dinner that he wanted to make. And David becomes all indignant. He said, this man should die. And Nelson said, this man is you. You have sinned against God. Yet all the women at your beck and call, you had to take somebody else's, so to speak. <coughs> what David says next is probably the most important contribution of David's life to us today. What does he say? Chatas. I have sinned. He didn't try to justify himself. He didn't try to see, say that he saw in the cosmos that Bathsheba's soul was destined to be united with his. He said, Chatasi. If God sees it as a sin, it's a sin. There's no other way to see it. What did Shaul HaMelech, what did King Saul say when Shmuel gave him an opportunity to come clean? He said, well, such wonderful Angus bulls. We're going to slaughter them? We took them to sacrifice them to God. When a God had said, destroy everything. What was Samuel's response? Toiv shamua zevach toiv. Better to listen than bring me fat and great offerings. Just listen. So many people ask, why was Saul punished so severely? He made a little mistake. David did something a lot more serious, a lot more terrible. So in today's day and age, we would make the distinction. Well, Saul, he erred in matters of state. <laughs> David was personal. <laughs> That's what people say about the latest political uh, presidential blunders, right? Makes a difference. 
Mm -mm. It wasn't the difference, though. The difference was that David acknowledged and, said, and, and Saul did not. And that acknowledgement brought about the acceptance of his atonement. So David was allowed to continue as king. And he gives us yet another message of hope and encouragement. That Hashem will forgive if you acknowledge. Hashem is not looking for retribution. Hashem is looking for purity, for holiness. And Hashem understands that human beings are human beings. But it didn't come it didn't come without pain. Hashem told him that from his own house there will be a movement against him. So the suffering of his own children, of Shalom, and his rebellion was a punishment for David. So what does King David say? He said, Chaneni Novenaseni. Well, after this experience, what did he say in a further psalm? Al tevieni lideni sayon. Please, God, don't test me anymore. I'm not that confident as I used to be. You've taught me a wonderful lesson. My friends, it's one thing when you're confronted with an adversarial condition, with a tragedy. But we don't pray for them. We don't ask God for test, to te be tested for those experiences. Yes, of course, a test gives one an opportunity for incredible growth. But we don't ask Hashem for those kinds of tests. We'll try to reach that level of growth without the tests. Give us taiv, hanira v'hanigla. Give us revealed good, not good that you have to go and... Look for it with a magnifying glass. So David recognized that. Al Tavieni Lideni say. And what did he say? Vichatosi Negdi Sami. David said that this sin is always before me. I always keep this sin before me. Even though he repented, and even though Hashem forgave him. He never forgot. And this kept him on that high spiritual level during his entire life. David HaMelech is the ancestor of Mashiach. So our sages tell us that when the Messiah will come, the world will revert back to, will be elevated to a state of being and existence that existed before Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge. Evil will no longer be this tempting, um, this tempting option for us. We'll no longer be tempted by evil. And it's another whole class to explain to you what happened exactly with Eve eating from the tree of knowledge she brought evil into the world in a way that we are now intimate with evil, we understand evil, we relate to evil, whereas before it was outside, and therefore the challenges become all that much greater. But when the Messiah will come, evil will be lifted from the world. And so Adam, in bequeathing 70 years of his life in the beginning of time to David HaMelech, was facilitating, ultimately, with the coming of Mashiach, which is a descendant of David HaMelech, was facilitating the rectification of his failure, which will come when Mashiach will come. And so, you might ask, what will we be doing when Mashiach comes? If the whole world is now engaged in a, a, a struggle with evil. And that's the purpose. What are we going to do when Mashiach comes? It's going to be quite boring. 
So just briefly, again, this is a subject for another whole class. But what we will be doing is we will be going from strength to strength in the realm of good and holiness. There is no end. It's, it's unlimited, the realm of goodness. And the challenge will be, will be to motivate us. We're almost done. We're almost done. This is it. This is it. The challenge will be to motivate ourselves to increase in the realm of good without the motivation of evil. And that will be an incredible challenge. But may we merit to confront that challenge with the coming of Mashiach Tzitkenu Mubeir Yom. If you liked that video, hit the subscribe button and notification bell below for hours of the best Jewish content online.